welcome to today, to today's WALS um, seminar. And I'm, I'm truly very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Yakiko Yamashita. Dr. Yamashita obtained her PhD from Kyoto University, where she worked with Mitsuhiro Yanagita, studying cell cycle regulation and fission yeast. After completing her PhD, she remained at Kyoto University, where she undertook a short but extraordinarily productive postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Shiniki Takata, examining the regulation of genome stability and DNA repair in higher eukaryotes. After obtaining this basic training in the regulation of the cell cycle, Dr. Yamashita went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Minx Fuller at Stanford University. And it's at Stanford that Dr. Yamashita initiated her studies on the regulation of stem cells using the Drosophila male germline as her model system. In 2007, Dr. Yamashita accepted a position as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan at the Center for Stem Cell Biology. At the University of Michigan, Dr. Yamashita has explored how the canonical mitotic cell cycle is specifically modified during the asymmetric stem cell divisions and why these modifications are important to stem cell maintenance. More recently, she has made numerous seminal contributions to her understanding of the role of centromere position during asymmetric stem cell divisions and how this process of centrosome and spindle positioning is misregulating during aging in stem cells. Dr. Yamashita is a recipient of a 2008 Serial Scholar Award. In 2011, she was chosen as a MacArthur Fellow, and in 2013, was, she was named a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator. Currently, Dr. Yamashita is an Associate Professor at the University of Michigan, and today uh, we are very excited to hear about her work in a talk entitled Asymmetric Stem Cell Divisions in the Drosophila Male Germline. Yamashita. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mari, for a nice introduction. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, so as Mari introduced, um, you know, my lab is really interested in asymmetric cell division in general. So as all of you know, the cell division is a process. One cell divides into two cells, right? And then that's, you know, the how, uh, so much is known about how, you know, cells are making the very, very precise copy of itself. However, asymmetric division is a little different from regular division. Essentially, they share the most of the process of making the copy of the exactly same cells, but they are distinct after they are born. Uh, you know, they're adapting a kind of a little different, uh, you know, the fate or characteristics. So then, if you remember, I know you don't remember when you were this, but you know, when you came to the existence to this world, each of us used to be a single cell. And today we are, you know, we are, you know, we are functioning human beings, you know, thinking and talking and listening and so on. And then, so instead of being, you know, the hundred something pounds of you know the culture of cells in a bucket, we are functioning human beings. So why? You know, how does that come, you know, where does that come from? And then you know, the one, you know, the big important process is that starting from the single cell, this cell didn't undergo just simple, you know, the replicative divisions. Instead, they kept making different kind of the cells at some point involving asymmetric cell divisions. That's how now we are made of, you know, the you know, 100 billion cells with all different functions. That's why we function as a human beings instead of just a bucket of culture cell. So that's one thing, you know, that, you know, the, that this mystery of asymmetric cell division is something that keeps fascinating me. And, you know, the framework of asymmetric cell division has been kind of worked out. So one idea is although cells are made equal, um, you know, the, those two daughter cells of the one division put in a different environment. That's why you know, the only one cell is under the influence of a certain microenvironmental signal. That's why two, two daughter cells are different from each other. And then, in some other cases, cells prepare such that upon division, only one cell inherits some sort of fate determinant. That's why they take on a different fate. Um, so, you know, the my laboratory you use uh, the stem cell as a kind of model system because um, the, you know, the stem, cells, stem cell is the one population that heavily relies on asymmetric cell division. So whenever stem cell divide, their daughter has to make this critical decision to stay as a stem cell undifferentiated and then maintain a proliferated capacity 
or coming to the differentiation, losing uh, proliferative capacity, but acquiring certain very, you know, the specialized function, like, you know, the absorbing nutrients or conducting electricity and so on. So then, of course, as you can easily imagine, you don't want to tip off this balance. So if you go either side, like too many, uh, you know, the too many stem cells instead of a differentiating cell, that can lead to eventually cancer. On the other hand, uh, if too many daughter cells, those stem cell division, take on the differentiation phase, now you deplete the stem cell so that you can't really replenish your tissue any longer, leading to tissue degenerative disease or tissue aging. So how do you maintain this balance? One very nice way of achieving it is asymmetric stem cell division to create one stem cell and one differentiating cell. So in this manner, you start out with one stem cell and up with one stem cell. So that means uh, you know, there's no net increase or decrease in the stem cell number. At the same time, you get this you know, one, another cell that, you know, that can differentiate to replenish your tissue. So we study this question using Drosophila male germline stem cell, that's a Drosophila testis as a model system. So the reason we use this system is its simplicity. Not necessarily it's easier these days anymore because you know, there's so much techniques available in, uh, you know, in many you know, higher, UK, you know, higher organisms. However, still you know, the Drosophila system provides such an excellent, you know, the very, very, you know, the precise, you know, the, you know, the description about everything, so that you can really stick to very, very rigorous logic in, you know, understanding all those, you know, biological processes. So out of this fly, you can take out the testis just in a matter of 20 seconds or even less once you get really used to it. And then this fly testis is very nicely arranged in, uh, you know, the old cells in this tissue is arranged in a very nice way in a spatial temporary, you know, the older manner. So it has coiled tubular structure from the apical tip and the tube goes to the basal side. Now if you take a look at the very apical tip, this is where most undifferentiated cells, which is stem cells, reside. Then once cells divide and leave this apical tip, cells you know, they keep differentiating toward more and more the differentiated side, and then around here is the meiotic cells, and then, you know, afterwards they become, you know, fully differentiated as a sperm, all those, you know, the bundle-looking structure or cells over here is, just, you know, the almost mature sperm. And then if you take a look at the very, very apical tip of the testis over here and zoom in, and then take a look, with, you know, under the microscope, but after staining with various combinations of the antibodies, you can, <coughs> identify all the cell types in this tissue, in this stem cell niche at the single cell resolution, which is the accuracy and precision I love to study, I mean, to study, you know, the biology using this system. So over here, shown in blue, is called hub cells. That functions a microenvironment for the stem cell or niche. So these hub cells are the cluster of the post-mitotic cells. So, you know, these blue things are, you know, the cell membrane marker, so you can probably appreciate around the 10 hub cells are making cluster over here, okay? And then, so these green cells attaching to the hub cells. So these are the germline stem cell. So in this anatomical context, hub cells secrete the signaling ligand to the neighboring germline stem cell. So this is idea how germline stem cell is maintained. So because signal essential for the stem cell identity is only provided by hub cells, you have to be attached to this microenvironment or the stem cell niche over here to be stem cell. So with that said, upon every division, these stem cells divide asymmetrically to create one stem cell and one differentiating cell. So differentiating cell is always geometrically displaced away from the hub cells. So that's why these cells cannot get any, uh, you know, the signal from the hub anymore. That's why they commit to the differentiation. So with this, you know, the structure, anatomical, geometric precision, you can address lots of, lots of things with, uh, you know, incredible accuracy. So, and then, uh, so a while ago, I mean, during my postdoc days, what first I found out was, so, how these stem cells divide asymmetrically. So that was 
you know, turned out to be because of the oriented cell division. So this germline stem cell orients its mitotic spindle always perpendicular towards the signaling source, have cells. So in this manner, the daughter cell is going to be always displaced away from the signaling source. This is, uh, you know, this is uh, how you uh, achieve the asymmetric outcome of the stem cell division. And then, interestingly, this orientation of the division is prepared way, way earlier during the cell cycle by the positioning of the centrosome, that's a major microtubular organizing center. So what is critical is that, you know, single centrosome before duplication earlier in a cell cycle is always on the side, very, very close to the heart, and the duplicate there, and after that, only one centrosome migrates toward the opposite side, whereas the other centrosome stays very close to the heart. So even before cells enter mitosis, these cells know exactly which way they are going to divide, and in this particular case, you know, the perpendicular toward the heart cells, so that one daughter is going to be dispersed away. So, and then this kind of you know, the analysis can be only done only if you can identify the stem cell at the single cell resolution by pointing out this is a stem cell. And otherwise, you won't be able to tell like, uh, you know, this precision. And then it turned out this centrosome that stays within the stem cell turned out to be the older mother centrosome. And then just a, you know, the younger daughter centrosome is the one that goes to the differentiating daughter. And it's not, this was the first example of the asymmetric centrosome behavior in any developmental context. And afterwards, it turned out uh, many systems, including uh, you know, the human embryonic stem cell, the mouse, you know, the neural stem cell, um, appears to take on the very, very similar uh, you know, the, you know, process to divide asymmetrically, suggesting that what you find in Drosophila is highly likely to be conserved in uh, you know, the you know, higher multicellular organisms. So I think I would like to emphasize, you, know, you can start out with a simple model system to learn a lot about ourselves. So, <clears throat> so as I said, this, you know, the germline stem cell reside in the stem cell niche. And then, so this niche is supposed to be emitting some signaling ligand. So for these stem cells to divide asymmetrically, first the point is this niche signaling has to be limited in a physical range so that only stem cell can be exposed to this signal, but then not the differentiating cell. And in this, you know, the context of this, uh, you know, the stem cell niche signaling, stem cell orient the mitotic spindle to divide asymmetrically by displacing one daughter away from the, uh, the stem cell niche. So then, uh, so these two things are, you know, the major topic of my talk today. So the first, let me talk about, you know, how oriented cell division, this division plane is really utilized, I mean, or established. So for a really long time, people have been guessing, or maybe, you know, that this niche factor might be regulating spindle orientation too. That was a very, very simple idea because, you know, the stem cell niche signal is determining the stem cell identity and then part of stem cell identity is oriented division, then the niche signal also regulates the stem cell division plane or division orientation. That's a very simple question to ask, but a very hard to address. Why? Because if you get rid of the stem cell niche signaling or stem cell niche, what happens? Stem cell is gone. So there's no stem cell left to score their orientation. So that's a very, very hard question to address. So that is a question the postdoc in my lab, Ophelia Chen, uh, tackled. So again, I'm showing the cartoon version of the germline stem cell attaching to the hub cells where germline stem cell always divide asymmetrically by orienting its spindle. And then differentiating daughter called the gonial blast is always displaced away from the germline stem cell. So then it's been known that this hub cells uh, secrete at least two ligands. And one is a ligand, a cytokine like ligand that uh, binds to the, you know, the cytokine receptor homolog called Domres and activate a jack start pathway. And the second pathway important for the stem cell identity in this system is BMP signaling pathway, that's DPP and then TKB receptor. 
So, and then one thing Ophelia noticed early on was that, um, maybe I can, yeah. So, let me, so this is probably clearer. So if you look at uh, you know, the UPD you know, in the hub cells, you can see you know, they, you, you know, they exist as a panther. We think this is a kind of secretion vesicle. And then all of these green cells are the germinal stem cell expressing tuberin GFP. So, and then one thing Ophelia noticed very, you know, the early on was that this UPD puncta appears to be always very, very close to the spindle pole, future spindle pole, like and then this, okay? And then each hub cell appears to contain about an average of one puncta. So this is actually the major source of, you know, the one puncta, puncta is a major source of the signaling ligand in each hub cell. So it's maybe not too surprising. I mean, this is only, how to say, um, so this UPD puncta is a sole source of the UPD ligand for this single germline stem cell. Okay, and then, so Ophelia was very interested in what's gonna happen if you get rid of this single puncta. So that's what she exactly did. So she did the laser ablation experiment to just remove one puncta, okay? So when she did that, and then if we, she watches, wait, waited to watch until this neighboring germline stem cell enter mitosis. And then what you see is the spindle is now parallel to the hub cells, okay? It's not perpendicularly oriented anymore. And then, uh, so if she scored, so it's very, very clear that in a normal situation, spindle is 100% oriented. However, once you ablate this puncta, and then to take a look at the spindle orientation, more than half of the spindles are not correctly oriented. And then most critically, the uh, one experiment, I, the control experiment I very much liked is that whenever you ablate a single UPD puncta, right, and then you are simply waiting, hoping this germline stem cell right next to it uh, enter mitosis. However, often case, of course, you know, it's like a fishing. You ablate here and it wait, 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 and then maybe some germline stem cell far away from the ablated puncta enter mitosis. And then you can actually score this, that's over here. So in this case, none of the spindles are misoriented at all. This suggests that this UPD puncta or this molecule is really regulating spindle orientation right next to it instead of far away. So this kind of suggests that it's not just about, you know, the, uh, the niche ligand is secreted and diffused and then to control everything about the germline stem cell to determine, and including, uh, you know, uh, the you know, spindle orientation. So, and then, but of course, you know, the fair, you know, the, you know, the doubt or question about this experiment is that still this UPD is a very essential factor to maintain the stem cell identity. So if you get rid of it, right, those stem cells simply stop being stem cells. That's why they can't just orient at all. So that's one possibility. So next, what Ophelia did was just to take a look at all you know, pathway components of this, you know, the jack star pathway to see if they regulate the spindle orientation or not. So she take a look at the UPD. This is a ligand that she ablated by laser ablation. And then now she also did the RNAi to remove this from the entire hub cells. Now eventually this leads to the stem cell loss, but you can catch the right timing where um, <clears throat> stem cells are not completely lost, but still you can see you know, the effect on the sp spindle orientation. And then if you knock down UPD, you can see very, very high frequency of spindle and then central cell misorientation like here. And if you take a look at the next, you know, the next level down in the pathway is the receptor cytokine, like recep cytokine receptor like receptor domeless. That also causes very, very high frequency of spindle misorientation. But very, very importantly, jack kinase and a stat it doesn't really cause any spindle misorientation at all over here. And then these conditions, because you're knocking down the jack stat pathway, you know, the final readout is gone, <coughs> these conditions eventually leads to the stem cell loss, suggesting that indeed the stem, overall stem cell identity is compromised over here. 
However, spindle orientation is totally fine. So this really suggests that the function of ligand and the receptor is probably independent of all those transcription network, a part of you know, the stem cell identity. So that's how we got really interested, okay, maybe we should take a look at these two molecules, ligand and the receptor, if they, you know, and how they might be regulating the spindle orientation. So the first thing, and, you know, the next thing you know, Ophelia did was to take a look at the dome, lo you know, the receptor localization. So in the interface, as you expect, uh, this receptor localized to the right place where the stem cell attached to the stem cell niche have cells over here, okay? So of course, this as a receptor of the ligand that's coming from the half, uh, receptor should be localizing around here, right? So then, but however, these cells start approaching to mitosis, two things happen. Number one, so these, you know, the receptors start accumulating on the spindle poles. And then in the metaphase, by metaphase, when cells, uh, you know, the stem cells form the fully, you know, the form the spindle, this receptor is on the spindle, okay? So that was something really unexpected, and of course we wanted to know this localization is dependent on the ligand, right? Um, so, and then it is. So in the interface, you see, you know, you barely see any, you know, the f concentration of the dominance in a receptor if you get rid of the ligand, okay? And then by prophase, they try to localize on the spindle pole, but then, you know, by metaphase, that, you know, the spindle localization of the receptor is very, very diminished. And the one thing I want you to notice is this. So this is not just an illusion or a focal plane issue. It's always that proximal pole, that is the side normally you see the ligand coming. That is the one that's mostly affected, more, you know, way more affected by this, you know, the RNAi of the ligand. And the receptor can't localize to the proximal spindle pole, but a distal spindle pole seems to be relatively okay. And then you can score, and then, you know, the measure the ratio of the, this dominant localization on the proximal pole versus uh, distal pole. In a wild type situation, yes, they localize with just one-to-one -one ratio. However, now in, upon knockdown of the ligand, what you see is the ratio goes below, below one, suggesting that you know, proximal pole localization is significantly and more severely affected by this you know, the, uh, removing, uh, removal of the ligand, okay? So, okay, I think this is just a control, so maybe I'm gonna skip mentioning this. So then we, we really wonder, you know, what, what this, you know, that this receptor is doing, localizing on the spindle, and then, you know, regulating the, you know, spindle orientation. So we thought there should be some, you know, the, some hints in their interaction to something that, you know, that could explain this, you know, the, its function on the spindle and then spindle orientation. And then we take a look, we took a look at this, you know, the Drosophila interactome database that has actually the very high quality immunoprecipitation mass spec data. And then when we looked at this, looking for the dome uh, receptor, you know, interactor, what we found was EB1, that's microtubule binding proteins, you know, the percent of microtubule binding proteins required for many aspects of the microtubule dynamics. And we confirmed my immunoprecipitation that, you know, the domeness and then, uh, you know, the EB1 physically interacts. And then if you knock down EB1, now you can see that that also causes a high frequency of spindle misorientation in the germline stem cell. And then how does that happen? And then we looked at, uh, you know, the sequence of the, this domeness receptor a little more carefully. And what we found is this, SQIP, SQXP is a perfect match, uh, you know, that's been already figured out as an EB1 binding motif. So, of course, we are in the process of making this mutant and to see if this is required for EB1 binding and then uh, for the spindle orientation. So, the, of course, the dream outcome is this SQIP deletion only compromise microtubule interaction and also only spindle orientation function without removing, uh, you know, the jack pathway activity. 
So that, that kind of a mutation is going to be a separation of function mutation so that we can address lots of lots of things. And so that's something you know, we are very much looking forward right now. So then, um, so it, relationship between EB1 and a DOM. So and as expected, you know, the EB1 localized to the spindle pole and then spindle later. And then upon DOM RNAi, you know, once you get rid of this, you know, the niche receptor, EB1 can't localize on a spindle anymore, okay? And then again, if you take a look at the very early phase around here, again, I think, you know, you might notice this, you know, proximal side of the EB1 localization on a spindle pole is dimmer. And if you quantify, again, you can confirm this, like EB1 localization is much, much weaker only on the proximal pole upon knocking down of the, this receptor dominus. So, um, this, you know, EB1 loss specifically at the proximal spindle pole, as well as dominus, uh, you know, the, uh, the loss, you know, the specific, the specific loss of dominus on the proximal spindle pole upon knockdown of the ligand. This really suggested that. Uh, so is there anything special about this proximal pole that is un anchoring or attached to the habocellar side, right? So the microtuber might be a little different on this side. That was the idea. So that means, you know, the UPD, dominus, and EB1 axis might be regulating something on this side. So then, so the idea is maybe, you know, the ligand is coming here, and then on this, specifically on this side, dominus receptor is somehow helping to maintain or regulate this special microtubule dynamics, specifically on this side. So that's why if you get rid of these things, and then, you know, the microtubule dynamics over here is messed up, and then leading to the spindle misorientation, that was the idea. So the based on this idea that microtubule dynamics might be different on this side compared to the distal side, we did one experiment, which is uh, you know the, just checking uh, the microtubule dynamics by photocompatible tubing. So I'm going to play the movie just in a second, but to orient you, sorry, this is actually upside down in the between two things. So this you know asterisk always shows have cells. So. In this spindle, this is germline stem cell, and in this spindle, proximal pole is facing up. And then in this particular movie, hub is facing down, so proximal side is facing down. I'm sorry about that. And then in this experiment, what, what Ophelia did was photocombat only half or you know, the part of the proximal pole or distal pole. So the upper movie is going to show the photoconversion of this tubing only at the proximal pole, the lower is the opposite side. So let me show you the movie. So if you combat the proximal pole over here, red shows up over here, and then very quickly this microtubule is observed to the opposite side as well. So suggesting that a microtubule is very, very dynamic over here so that it's gonna come to the other side very, very quickly. Let me show you one more time. And then meantime, let me also play the other movie. Here you are combating this other side. This microtubule barely make it to the other side at all, no matter how long you wait. So uh, let me try to start this movie at the same time so that probably hopefully you can see the difference. It's very quick from here to there, you know, proximal to this cell, but then it's very, very slow to, for the microtubule to move from this cell to the proximal side. So collectively, what we think is, so the proximal pole is different. To probably anchor and orient the microtubule, you have to have probably a stronger force to stay anchored. And because of the stronger force, you have to have you know, the stronger anchoring force or adhesive force over here, which is probably regulated by the ligand and the receptor. So, and then this is a way we think you know, to stabilize the spindle in the oriented way. Otherwise, you know, how does the spindle could be spinning? So, but this sort of pole is a kind of, uh, you know, the very, very stable pole. So one thing probably I can, you know, the one analogy I can make is that, you know, if I'm shaking with you and then weak falls, right? That's like uh, this sort of pole. And then nothing is really, 
I mean, dynamic. So you just smile and shake. This side may be stable, but then you know, me and you are shaking with you know, as you know, the the you know, with all might, like very very strong shake. And as long as your your force and your power and my power is matching, it doesn't look like very different from the other side. However, because actual force is very, very strong from both sides simply being matched, if one side, they say, you know, you know, I weaken my force, then your hand shaking force is going to overwhelm me and then I'm gonna start spinning. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, so, uh, and then yes, so they, probably there is a unique force and spindle dynamics to orient the spindle in the germline stem cell, that's one message. And then second thing is this niche signaling is really directly regulating or you know, the, um, this unique spindle force or in other, uh, as I was maybe I should say, the niche spindle, you know, the niche signaling is really part of holding the spindle pole to the right place. Okay, so let me switch the gear a little bit. I've been telling you that, okay, the niche signaling is kind of very limited so that only germline stem cell can, ex can be exposed to this niche signaling over here, right? How, and then in the, only in this context, the spindle orientation makes sense because orienting a spindle is going to kick away one daughter out of this signaling range. However, have you ever imagined like how niche cells know exactly how much ligand to produce so that this kind of environment is created? In another words, in now uh, you know the imaginary experiment, if this have cells or stem cell niche express so much of the ligand, right? And then, so no matter how you nicely orient the spindle, still both daughter is going to be under the influence of this signal. So the question has been, okay, how? Um, you know, the, the range of the niche signaling is really physically limited. Is that only just simple secretion so that, you know, the things will be surely diluted by the time, you know, the things come to the differentiating daughter? Is that, you know, how do you say, how cells are kind of okay with just hoping that, you know, what they are making is just enough, not too much, not too little. So we thought that's, that's kind of a little sloppy for this such a, you know, the beautiful system to really be precisely working. And then we, I think, you know, we got the, at least a part of the answer to it. So this was single-handedly done by a very, very talented postdoc in the lab, Mayu Inaba. So for the personal reasons, she had to relocate to UT Southwestern. And then, so that's how I couldn't afford, you know, losing her. So we set up the collaboration with Michael Buschak who's a faculty member at the UT Southwestern working on female germline stem cell. So I asked him to be a local host for Mayu so that we can keep doing this same work, but then now in a collaboration with Mike as well. So the one day, so Mayu came to me saying that germline stem cell has a very cute, funny protrusion into the cells. So in this micrograph is showing, um, you know, the tubulin GFP expressed only in a germline stem cell. So the germline stem cell is surrounding, you know, about eight of them right now over here, is facing toward the have cells, which is dark because it's not the, you know, the stem cell, so it doesn't express tubulin GFP, um, marked by asterisk. So my observation was that this old germline stem cell, most of the germline stem cell have nice protrusion always into the have cells. So then, the, my first reaction was, you know, Mayu, come on. So we have been using tubulin GFP forever, you know, I mean decades, if not centuries. So how come everybody has missed this? And she said, this seems to be a very, very fragile structure. If you fix it, mostly you lose it. And then you have to probably take a look at the live cell just using GFP without fixing. That's the best way to look at this. So with her words, instead of doing a new experiment to confirm this, I just simply went back with very, very old folder, my very, very old computer back in my postdoc days. And then 
I just dug out the image, and then there you go. So here, the one germline stem cell is poking this nice protrusion into the heart over here. So I was totally convinced, and obviously, at that time, I was busy looking at the spindle over here. That's why I missed this one. Okay. So, and then, so we wanted to know a little more about this structure, because, you know, when you say protrusion poking into the heart cells, what does that mean? Is, is there any hole, really? or you know, what kind of real geometric structure. So we did uh, 3D reconstitution of this structure. So in this particular image, this is germline stem cell, and then, so this is a protrusion going into the hub, and then this red is the marker, I mean, cell adhesion marker between germline stem cell and the hub cells. And these are the, you know, the cell cell junction between two hub cells like this and this, and I'm gonna rotate this, and then you can probably see that uh, this surface of um, this protrusion doesn't have the cell adhesion molecule over here, right? And then in a second, this red is going to disappear so that you can really see the protrusion is there. So, okay, and then over there. So now you see the poke, but then, Hub cells are really broken. You know, the surface of a hub cell broken to accept this, you know, protrusion, which isn't. That's, I'm gonna show just in a few seconds. Uh, but for a few reasons, we decided to call this microtube based on nanotube because of the structural similarity that's been identified in the culture cells, uh, which was named as tunneling nanotubes. And then the reason was we knew this is not the primary cilia. Or actin-based structure called the cytidine. We, we knew this is ease of this. And then tunneling nanotube has the broadest, you know, the definition in terms of structure and the molecular composition, so we felt that's fair to name it the nanotube. But then to make sure this is a microtube-based structure, we decided to call it a microtube nanotube or MT nanotube. So then this is showing that uh, actually there's no puncture on the cell membrane. So if you take a look at the microtube or nanotube over here, poking into the hub cells, you see the membrane is surrounding it. And then this, you know, the purple uh, is membrane dye. So you can see, you know, this nanotube is surrounded by the plasma membrane. And then again, let me show you the movie quickly. So, and then the, from the back side, and then you see this nanotube, and then soon this purple is going to go away, so that you can see inside um, is, yeah, inside, you know, the nanotube is poking in. And then, furthermore, we know this is, a, this surface of a nanotube is a double plasma membrane. That means germline stem cell side have a membrane on a, uh, on the surface of nanotube. At the same time, hub cell side also invaginate to accept this, you know, the nanotube. Because you can see by using this, you know, administrative GFP specifically expressed in the germline stem cell or in the hub cell side, both you can, you know, the illuminate this microtube nanotube, suggesting that the surface of nanotube is two plasma membrane, one coming from the germline stem cell, the other coming from the hub cell side. Okay. So then, uh, this nanotube is very, very specific to the stem cell. So almost every single germline stem cell has this nanotube, but it's very, 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 very rare in a differentiating germ cell. And then in the germline stem cell, it's always facing toward the cells, okay? So then, also I said this microtube nanotube is not the primary cilia. What we found is, uh, so this, this microtube nanotube has lots and lots of uh, the cilia components, like you know the interflagellar transport proteins, or you know the cilia remoter, for example, cryptin A is localizing to the microtube nanotube. And then all the other, you know, the IFT components are also localizing to the microtube nanotube. So, and this is kind of nice because not just um, you know the observation, at least we see the molecular composition, and then by looking at this, you know, the composition, you can also test its requirement. And then if you take a look at all those, you know, you know, we take a look at the pretty much everything. 
and then there's a few that affects the nanotube length or thickness. So one is, you know, the ciliary mortar that is known to suppress cilia growth. And that, if you knock it down, very similarly, microtube, nanotube also gets much, much thicker. And then if you knock down IFT complex, you know, the component that's, you know, all those IFT intrafragile transport proteins, now you lose the length of the nanotube. So this is good to address its function later on. So, and then, so of course we wanted to know what the kind of function this is really, you know, this microtube nanotube is having. And then, you know, the Mayu went ahead to take a look at all those, you know, the possible signaling components, you know, the known to be required for stem cell, you know, stem cell niche, you know, the interaction. So as I, you know, mentioned earlier, one pathway is UPD, right? UPD jack start pathway. The other pathway was BMP, uh, you know, the pathway. And then when Mayu was looking at all, everything, and then Mayu quickly realized this UPD or, you know, the jack start component seem, seem to have nothing to do with microtube or nanotube. Instead, what she found is this BMP pathway seems to be involved in, you know, or, you know, the functions through the microtube or nanotube. So this is a kind of control. I mean, if you express a GFP using germline specific driver, you can nicely illuminate the germline stem cell over here, right? Because of course you are expressing a GFP in a stem cell, you should be able to see a stem cell over here. And then this area, which is blacked out, this is the hub cells, okay? However, instead of a GFP, when she expressed, uh, you know, the DPP passive receptor, which is called the TKB, thick vein in Drosophila, now, this is still expressed in the same place as GFP positive over here. All of TKB GFP was observed in the house cells instead of germline stem cell. So that means this TKB GFP is still must be made around here, but all moving into the house cells. So why this is happening? So, so this is something I really like about Drosophila. You can make all those mosaic in the background of you know the complete dark and everything, so so that you can really get the very very nice resolution of the cell biology. So in this particular experiment, Mayu made uh, you know the single clone, single germline stem cell expressing tubulin GFP and then this receptor TKB. Now you can see this single germline stem cell. It's shooting very nice, you know, the microtube nanotube into the hub cells over here, right? And then this exactly same cell is also expressing red, you know, the MCHERI tagged TKB. Now you can see this MCHERI TKB is on the microtube nanotube. So this really suggests indeed this receptor of the BMP, you know, pathway is generated in the cell body of this germline stem cell and then traffic to the microtube nanotube, okay? And then so that's, uh, you know, this is how we think, you know, the germline stem cell shoot out this microtube nanotube, and the TKB receptor is made inside the germline stem cell, move into the hub cells along the microtube nanotube, okay? And then, so is, is this where, uh, you know, the TKB bind to the ligand and then, you know, gets activated? It seems so. So what we see is now in this experiment, DPP GFP, you know, the ligand GFP is expressed from the hub side. And then this TKB MCHERI is expressed from the germline side. And then they completely co-localize in the hub cell. So that means this, you know, the TKB receptor is trafficked to the microtube nanotube. That's where it binds to its ligand that's coming from the hub cells, okay? So that means instead of hub cells secreting DPP to the outside world so that germline stem cells are expected to look for it and then get it, instead, this light, you know, the stem cell niche ligand receptor interaction is happening specifically at the surface of this microtube nanotube, okay? And then we even added, uh, you know, the additional experiment. This is a co-expression of just regular TKB imagery and this tip is a GFP tagged marker that becomes GFP positive only when it's ligand bound. So these also co-localize completely. 
So this suggests that not just a TKB protein, receptor protein, but it's active form that's localized on the nanotube. Okay, and then, so of course we wanted to make a connection between this observation, localization, observation, and then functional outcome. So one thing is, uh, you know, as I said, you know, because we know the which genes are localizing on the microchip and nanotube, you can manipulate, right? And then what we see is, uh, if you increase the microchip or nanotube, you see more of the TKB in the hub area compared to the control. Instead, if you get rid of the microtube or nanotube, what happens is TKB, instead of going into the hub cells over here, it start localizing on the plasma membrane of the germline stem cell. So that means this, you know, the IFT components are specifically required to traffic this TKB native in the germline stem cell into the, uh, you know, the microtube or nanotube, okay? And then, of course, we wanted to take a look at the readout. That is, uh, uh, you know, the BMP pathway activation, which can be monitored by phosphomar, in case of mammar, that's a phosphosmar, a PSMAD. Then this is a wild type situation where germline stem cell has some, you know, basic, you know, basal amount of, you know, the DBP activation only in a germline stem cell. If you increase, you know, the thickened nanotube, what happens is the signal gets way, way higher. And then if you get rid of the microtube or nanotube, the signal gets way, way weaker. And then uh, quantification is over here. So yeah, if the more microtube or nanotube, more DPP signaling, and then less microtube or nanotube, less microtube, or, I mean, less uh, the DPP signaling. And then as a result, because you know, this DPP pathway, BMP pathway is required for the stem cell maintenance, which has been already known for some time. So if you get rid of microtube or nanotube by certain mutation over here and then over here, now the, what you see is a problem in the stem cell maintenance. So compared to the wild type control, like which maintains the stem cell number relatively okay, so these mutants cannot maintain a stem cell in the long run. So with that, uh, you know, I think, um, so I, I wanted to summarize what I told you today. So the first, uh, so you know, the, this later part of what I told you is, so we identified this previously unrecognized structure which we named the microtube nanotube. And then this microtube nanotube penetrates into the stem cell niche. And then in this way, uh, you know, only stem cell can engage in a productive, uh, you know, the niche stem cell, you know, the, you know, the signaling. So in this way, now you don't even have to worry how much a cells has to produce this ligand because it might diffuse too far because it probably doesn't diffuse at all, okay? So then, so we think this is probably, you know, the functioning as a mechanism of the very, very selective, non-diffusible stem cell niche signaling. And then earlier part of my talk, I also told you, you know, the niche signaling, that's another pathway of the niche signaling, which is, you know, the Jackstar pathway, UPD, ligand, and domeless receptor, is right now, it doesn't go to the nanotube at all. We take a look at that. And then it doesn't go to the, you know, the nanotube, but then stay on the surface where they also help to anchor the spindle so that they always divide, you know, with oriented spindle so that they can always divide asymmetrically. So, you know, for a really long time, you know, I was always very, very curious why, you know, the this stem cell niche has to have two signaling pathways. Now I feel that, you know, we started segregating these two, you know, the, um, you know, the niche ligand, you know, niche signaling pathways. So, you know, the one is really doing a very, very exclusive niche signaling, you know, the function. The other one, pro you know, the might also, you know, the other one is really regulating spindle orientation very, very, you know, in the, uh, you know, the highly regulated manner. On top of that, my, my guess, this from here, that's my guess, is because this UPD doesn't utilize this nanotube, I suspect that this UPD might be actually diffusing. So then in that case, so if anything happens to germline stem cell, then you have to probably, you know, signal to the, say, differentiating cell to recover them back now to function as a stem cell. Now you can use this second signal to, for example, you know, let the other cells de-differentiate so that you can recover the germline stem cell. And then, so by having this dual system, 
when, you know, in the presence of functional stem cell, no other cells can really compete to come to the stem cell niche. However, anything emergency happens, right? And then now just one signal is enough to recover the situation. So that way you can maintain the very best of stem cell for as much as they are really there. But you know, as long as they are there. However, once it's gone, you still have a plan B. So to maintain the stem cell, you know, the stem cell populations and then so that you can maintain the this, you know, tissue homeostasis as long as possible. So with that, uh, okay, so the spindle orientation of UPD part was done by Ophelia Chen, the very, very dedicated postdoc. And then, so the nanotube part was done by Mayu Inaba, and as a very, very dedicated postdoc, and she is ready for a job anytime right now. So if you're hiring, I mean, she's fantastic. I'm saying that everywhere. I think, you know, she's just, I always think myself, like, I can't love science more. She's the only person who makes me think, oh, here is a person who might love science even more than I do. So I think, you know, she, she I, I would say she's cheap because, you know, she's going to dilute your, her hourly date by working longer and longer and longer. So, I mean, and then she has unlimited source of the imagination in a very, very productive imagination. She's going to do a great, you know, be a great faculty member. So that's it. And then happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hi, I have two questions about your nanotubes. Yes. The first is, do you see exchange with the cytoplasm with the inside of the nanotubes? You know, so primary cilia don't exchange freely. Right. Do you oh, see the same thing in your... And also the, uh, between the germline stem cells... That's correct, yeah, yeah. And we think there's a diffusion barrier. Uh, we don't have a... Oh, uh, there's some molecules which is never observed in the nanotube, like GFP. If you just make, you know, the just GFP, it, it never observed in the microtube or nanotube. So I think there's, there should be some, you know, the active mechanism that's, you know, that let them go into the microtube and nanotube. And then, so I, I believe, but the, the data is not the strongest yet. Yeah, but I think there should be a diffusion barrier. And so the other question is more broad. Do you see these in any other circumstances? So flies don't have primary cilia and there's so much signaling that takes place on primary cilia. Is this their substitute? You know, that's very, very, you know, the great speculation. I, I think that might be, yeah. I. That, that's definitely the way, you know, we are now going. So we want to definitely address, you know, all, you know, because this, as I said, this is very, very sense, you know, the fragile structure sensitive fixation. I don't think anybody have really seriously looked at it. Now you, you can just simply look at every, you know, everywhere, and then this might be utilized as a substitute. Yeah, that's really great idea. I think, you know, I mean, feel free to look into your tissue. <laughs> similar question. Did you see these nano, uh, nanotube kind of structures with the cyst cells because the germline stem cells mm -hmm. and the germ cells are in close right. contact with the cyst so cells? So we so far looked at the female germline stem cell as well as somatic stem cell in the, in the testes. Both of them seem to have this microtube and nanotube, but we haven't characterized sufficiently to be able to confidently say how different they are or they are functional or we don't know, but they exist. Uh, nanotube-like structure in at least a two other cell types. Okay. Yep. How stable is this microtubule nanotube yeah. structure? Good question, yeah. Is it changing with time? To me, it looks like an anchoring so mechanism. So the one part I decided not to include to my talk because that was too much. Um, so the, their behavior is kind of very similar to primary cilia. That means in the interface, they maintain microtube and nanotube very, very stably. If you do the movie, it doesn't change the length or you know, thickness at all for hours. But right before mitosis, it gets retracted into the, you know, that it, it, it's retracted. And then right after mitosis, it comes back, just like primary cilia. But it's not the primary cilia. That's a very funny behavior. So in the interface, it's very stable, but during the cell cycle, it comes out and then, you know, disappear, comes out, disappear. So this is a very unique system for the 
Drosophila, uh, germline stem cell? I don't think so, because for example, something very similar to microtube nanotube is called a cytonin. That is an actin-based structure, but you know, the, if you look at the just morphology of the protrusion, they look similar. And then first, this cytonin was found in the drosophila tissue to mediate you know, a few signaling, like you know, the DBP, as well as uh, you know, the FGF, uh, you know, the signaling ligands. And then this very, very similar cytonin is now found in you know, the chicken embryos and uh, a few other you know, the vertebrate systems too. So by analogy, <laughs> Um, you know, I won't be surprised if we find, you know, microtube or nanotube in the, in the vertebrate system. But at the same time, another very, very fantastic idea is, you know, the maybe, you know, the microtube or nanotube is a substitute of primary cilia, in which case, you know, vertebrate has primary cilia, so maybe they don't need it. So, I mean, either way, that's fantastic. So, I mean, we want to really look into that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I was uh, curious about the mechanism that orients the nanotube. Yeah. So if you were to ectopically express DPP in some yeah. other cell, would you yes. create a new? Yes, we did, yeah. yeah. So we ectopically express the DPP from completely far away cells. Now germline cells, even, even you don't have to be germline stem cell. Even differentiating spermatogonia started shooting this nanotube toward that cell. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Really great talk. How sure are you that there's no motor taking the uh, the TK uh, P, uh, up to the uh, microtubule nanotube? Uh, is it really diffusion based, or or is there, could oh, there be a motor? There's any motor? I mean, we know at least you need IFT, right, interfragile transport. But exactly how TKB is trafficked into the nanotube as a cargo, that kind of molecular mechanism, we don't know yet. Yeah, that's a good, really good question. Sorry, I have a very basic question. I'm not sure I fully understand. So these models that you're doing, are they all in the Drosophila, or this is in, in vitro that you see this uh, This is actually the, you know, the, the, you know, the tissue right out of uh, you know, the Drosophila. So some of, I mean, that's a essential intact tissue. Sometimes we you know, the fix them right away after we isolate the tissue from the Drosophila. And then, or sometimes we do a, a little bit of short term, you know, ex vivo culture to do the, you know, the live imaging. Right. Yep. So it's ex vivo culture. Do you ever see the cells that are, that are not the stem cell anymore? They're differentiated, but they come from the stem cell. They never have this microtubule or even something like it. Right. And then In the normal no. conditions, yeah. differentiating cells barely have any. But, but you know, so we calculated that's 0 0.0002 nanotubes per cell, something like that. So it's not zero, but very any. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. On that note, I would like to okay. thank Dr. Yamashita. We have thank a little uh, token of our appreciation oh, for oh, thank coming you. to the NIH. Oh, you know, wow, store. great. Thank you very much. Wow. I think I... we send it to you so you don't have to take it. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> That's a good idea. I don't want to. And I want to remind airport. everybody there is a little reception right at the library. Please uh, join us at the reception to honor Dr. Yamashita. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.